start. Okay. Good evening, Justice Mosineke and your lovely wife that's with you. Vice Chancellor Adam Habib, Chair of its Council, Isaac Shongwe, members of the judiciary, friends, colleagues, students. We have the local and international legal fraternity. Tonight we have a wide range of people joining us this evening. And so good evening to everyone. My name is Wissal Domingo. I'm the head of the Wits School of Law. On behalf of the school, I'd like to welcome you all to the celebration of a wonderful memoir by one of South Africa's foremost legal minds, Justice Dihang Moseneke. We are delighted that Justice Moseneke is kicking off his virtual book tour at Wits. He was the chancellor at Wits for 12 years and in 2018 was conferred with an honorary doctorate in recognition of his significant political, social, and economic contribution to South Africa and its people. He challenged the WITS community from health to law to accounting to reflect on the importance of ethics in the professions. And this has inspired the academic community, particularly at WITS, to think more carefully about how we incorporate ethics into our teaching. I don't want to spend too much time on Justice Musineke's biography. You are all here because you know who he is. And for those of you who want to know more and have not yet read his wonderful first book, My Own Liberator, you should head out to Love Books tomorrow to get a copy. It is a rich memoir of his life, the people who influenced him and his political business and judicial career. A number of commentators have spoken of Justice Musineke's contribution not just to shaping the constitution, but to make it a living document for South Africans. His book, and I'm going to, let me show you that book. <laughs> All Rise, a judicial memoir, and this is his new book, which we're launching tonight, is a wonderful anthology of his years on the bench and particularly his 15 years as deputy chief justice serving in the constitutional court. The stories in this book make law accessible to non-lawyers and in years to come will be an important part of the library that explains the politics of our society during these years. Our panelists this evening are Professor Kathy Albertain and Ms. Shamika Samara de Wakera, Wesin Judara. Kathy holds the NRF's Sarchi Chair for Equality, Law and Social Justice and Sharmika is a lecturer in jurisprudence and constitutional law, and they are both law academics in the Wits School of Law. So the format tonight is that Justice Musineke will speak for about 15 minutes on the book, after which Kathy and Sharmika will spend about 10 minutes, each reflecting on the book and perhaps posing some questions. We will then open up to questions from the audience. Now, please remember, if you were in the first 500 people to register, you will be joining this launch via Zoom and you can use the chat section to pose questions. If you did not make it into the 500 cutoff, you'll be joining us via YouTube and unfortunately will not be able to participate. We will then close tonight's events with a few words from our Vice Chancellor, Professor Adam Habi. I want to end with a call Justice Mosineke made to the Wits community in 2018. He asked us to seek personal agency, to strive for public agency, and to continue to do as much as we can for Africa and society. So this book is a testimony to how he has driven to live up to those values and an inspiration to all of us to rise up. Rise up and be part of building a more equitable society. It comes at an important time in our development. And I trust this conversation is exactly what we need right now. So welcome everyone. I'm now going to hand you over to Justice Mosineke to talk about the book. Professor Domingo, starting with you VC, with whom I've worked, as I say, you've said for 12 years. Uh, Professor Kathy Albertain, we've known each other for forever. Um, easily three decades now. So I am very, very grateful. Shamika, we're meeting now and I'm, I'm delighted. Uh, I was saying the other day that I would hope that young academics would wrestle with this and raise the difficult questions with me uh, more rigorously than the more settled academics who have come to uh, accept their surroundings more readily. 
But thank you. I don't propose to use all the 15 minutes, um, starting with bragging with my wife, who's next to me, who has joined me, and we had to endure the many hours of writing my first book, and I say so in it, and, and, and the second book. And I'm, I'm very grateful. I know she'll disappear shortly and go and watch this from, um, from YouTube, as she prefers. So I'll use less than 15, but let me, let me try and go at it. This is an attempt to try and locate the judicial function, slam bang in the middle of uh, our transitional democratic project. And to recognize that a judicial function is an overall part of a process of trying to migrate our society from one unlit corner to a better lit place. In other words, to improve our neighborhood significantly. And judges traditionally often sit in some ivory tower. And that is exemplified and symbolized by many things, the high standing uh, <clears throat> benches on which they sit and look at everybody else down out there. And somehow the theme and the approach has always been near untouchables who should be entitled to a considerable margin of appreciation. And I thought at the end of my term, it might be time to lift the judicial veil, I would have said the judicial gown. And I thought that I would try and do it in a way that is accessible because the book is directed not at law professors, and judges or senior or junior counsel or senior or junior attorneys. The book is directed at South Africans and that the judicial function is very much part of the larger project to try and create a just society. And I don't mean that lightly, not only in the political sense, in the broad social sense and in every and individual spaces. Think about gender inequality. Think about choices people make about their sexuality. Think about how people pray, what they eat, what they cook, where they go to school. So these, some of those are very private spaces. So the law function is supposed to be that pervasive. It covers all of those areas. So I went about to say, how do I do it? Maybe let me break it up first into how do I got to be a judge? And I spent a bit of time and tell the little story of my aunt saying, Dikhan, what do you want to be? And I said, Travi Cobb, aunt. And she said, no, 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 no. You must, you must try harder than that. Travi Cobb, no disrespect, but you've got to do better. And then, and, and then of course, I tell you a little bit very fleetingly about my encounter with law its Eurocentric roots, its demand that all of us must study Latin, English, and Afrikaans near the lands. And if you couldn't pass each one of those courses, you remember Kathy Albertine, you were out. You would never get into LLB. And, and, and I start telling you why it is so. Because essentially our law is part of the colonial project. It was an imposition. And we had to live with the imposition. And I could see it as a young man on Robben Island. But then I got on, I knew that I had to study to pass so that I can be useful rather than ruminate about its origin all the time. And I do that in the book and tell you what I think about it as an imposition and move on. And then would I have been a judge? I thought, maybe not. But there I was, and then I was going to study and ultimately I end up on the high court. Having had a very enjoyable, I think, uh, uh, career at the bar, and I talk a little about that, much as of pushing to destroy apartheid, there were things worthy of learning. And I, and, and I take young lawyers there and how you, you maneuver through oppression to try and make sense out of all that by bringing relief to people who are, who are oppressed and excluded and, and exploited economically. And then I move on to break up the, the course into different 
era, starting with the Chaskosan era, and show you the honeymoon period, and move quickly away from there um, after having shown you the rich jurisprudence that came out of that time. And why it was a honeymoon period, almost everything was all glazed up in, you know, in all things good and wonderful. Uh, and then that quickly disappears as we start and kick off with the TAC case. You have a government on the one end obliged to provide access to medical care, but not going to do it for people who are struck by HIV and AIDS, another pandemic. And then the story of the court unfolds from there, from the Mbeki era, and, and moves on to, uh, to, to, to a phase ultimately where Mbeki is removed as president. And I tell you how the court was immersed in all of that, including the SCA was called upon to pass, you know, judgment and reverse the Nicholson J judgment and so ending as and when we're all thrown into a horrific a time when there was litigation full throttle. And I try and describe that to show you how the judiciary had to catch the fallout and the fight and contestation within the ruling elite. Um, and also you know, assertion of rights by ordinary people, albeit assisted by public, you know, interest entities. And in that way, the court flourished, its jurisprudence flourished. And that gets you into the longer era, I talk about that. And it moves us into the noble era and right slam bang in the middle of, of course, the Zuma hegemony. Um, and that ultimately moves on to the Mohueng era. So very carefully, I try and show you the mood of the nation as a background and try and show you the moving pieces and the larger themes. And as I do that, as you commented earlier, Kathy Albertine, I try and bring to citizens and to young lawyers what the judicial function is. A lot of lovely snippets, hopefully, which are which are able to get people laughing and the light ended side of being a judge. Uh, I go to all the debates and the stories around atheism and so on. But all in all, I'd hope it would be easily assimilable book, accessible, and that would serve to record a part of our history. And I'd like to lastly thank Vitz for having made it possible this is the formal official launch of this book. I must confess, four or five other universities are going to follow on your heels very shortly, but it's proper that be debated by the academy and by courts and, and practitioners and the public in other parts of, of, uh, of the country. And a few media platforms you know, like Daily Maverick and, and so on and others will also be holding their own webinars. And hopefully, Professor Domingo to discuss the issues and the themes that emerge out of, out, out of the book. But again, a privilege to have your country fit you out like this and listen to, you know, the penny, hey penny contribution that you put down on paper. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Musaneke. I'm going to hand over now to Kathy and then to Sharmika. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Domingo, and, and thank you, Justice Musaneke. It is indeed a, a real honor and privilege to speak at, at this book launch and actually quite humbling. I've been looking forward to this book since I read your previous book and you said you were going to talk about your judicial role and, of course, I was secretly hoping that it would be a kind of judicial kiss and tell all. You would give us all the backstories on the exciting and fractious cases. But of course, that's not really what judicial memoirs are. And of course, a judge of your stature and integrity um, is not going to write that kind of memoir. So it's, it's an interesting idea for me, a judicial memoir and speaking with a judicial voice. Um, in sharing the law and politics of our country, because I think it's both enabling and constraining. 
in terms of what you're able to say and the insights that you have, but also what you're not able to say. Um, and where being a judge um, and your leadership role and, 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 and your judicial role determine uh, what you can do. Um, what I love about the book is that you put yourself at the center of it and say, what does it mean to be a good judge? And ask the question, have I been a good judge? Um, and you ask that at several levels, as you say, you ask it to the level of, of, of the individual human being and the judge at the level of the jurisprudence of the court and at the level of the institution itself. Um, and I want to very briefly talk about just those three levels and maybe pose some issues. I, I think at the level of being a judge is just a really important part of the book for students and, and for lay people. I mean, for lawyers, we take it for granted that we understand what judges do. But I think this book really demystifies that role. Uh, it talks about well, what are the qualifications for being a judge and how they've changed over time and how have we been able to shift an almost all white, almost all male, well, let's say all white, all male judiciary into one that is far more diverse by beginning to shift the taken for granted qualifications of what it means. The selection process of the JSC, your own experience of that, which you admittedly say was a positive experience. Um, and, and how you were able to go through that. The daily work of the High Court judge, I mean, just setting out that daily grind uh, to show how very hard our judges work. And then the processes of collective but independent adjudication of the Constitutional Court. I mean, I, even as somebody who knows about this, I find this incredibly um, useful and will be prescribing it for my students. And I think what comes across particularly strongly there is just how hard judges work. You talk at one point about sitting in court all day and then having to go home and still read the record and distill the evidence. Also very interesting, and I think very personal to you, but many other judges is the need to maintain a social distance in the old sense of social distance and to maintain some distance from the political fray. But in the same time, your insistence that judges should also be thought leaders, that you should be out there talking to the public, talking to young people about the constitutional project, about the judicial function, and about jurisprudence in general. And I think it's a role that you've played with, um, uh, with absolute prestige over the years, but it's also arguably the role, I think, that attracted the kind of hostility from members of the executive that really affected your chances within the judiciary um, over 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 time. So the personal is, is of course, always political, uh, if you like, in, in the judiciary. I was particularly interested, of course, being a, a public lawyer on the record of the jurisprudence running through the court. And I really enjoyed the way that you parceled it up into different categories. You aligned it to the courts. You began to show us how the issues changed over time, how early on it was still the fighting and the infighting over federalism and the TRC and how that will all pan out. Later on, it became about rights. And of course, much later on, it became about political accountability. But you're very faithful to your judicial voice in this part of the work, frustratingly <laughs> so for all like me. You stick very much to the issues and the judgments. Correctly so, you let the judgments or the judges speak for themselves. And if you do acknowledge controversy, as I think you do, for example, in, in the Mazabuko case, it's only to very politely refrain from engaging. <laughs> now, I know that you have engaged outside of the book in, in academic texts, um, but I was interested in, in how, you, uh, how you shape your judicial voice in this book, because it's, it, 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 it's very much front and, and center. There was a, a modicum of judicial regret about a judgment, and that was Fawkes versus Robinson. And I was interested in why it was that case, uh, which of course <laughs> close to my feminist heart. Um, for those of you who don't know, it was a case that denied rights to cohabiting heterosexual partners um, around maintenance after the death of your partner. The very same rights that had been extended to same-sex uh, cohabiting partners and to previously excluded marriages. Um, and the court divided almost three ways on, on, on that case. Justice Mosaneki went with the majority. I like to think he might have gone with either the O'Regan or the Sachs minority in another, in a parallel world. Um, but that technique of letting the legal documents talk for themselves, I think you use very powerfully when you talk about Judge Chlope, 
because of course Judge Klopper, as you rightly point out, is still a live case, horrifyingly so, 12 years after the complaint was made, and you are still a witness in that case. Um, uh, so you obviously have to be careful in how you deal with that case. And what you do is you say to us, you be the judge. You put the documents down, you put the collective affidavit of the Constitutional Court down. Uh, listeners uh, will remember that this was a collective complaint made by all judges of the Constitutional Court about an attempt, an alleged attempt by Judge Klope to improperly influence two judges in relation to a case dealing with the search and seizure of documents from Zuma's residence around his, his corruption trial. And Justice Masaneki just puts it out there for you and he says, you decide. I'm going to refrain from comment. I can't say anything. The one very strong and powerful comment, of course, you do make is the comment about the delay the unacceptable delay in resolving that case. And of course, it would be interesting to hear what you say about the consequences of that today, when the allegations, of course, are piling up against the same, the same judge. Um, so it, I thought that was the power of, 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 the, of the judicial voice. And of course, the third strand over and above the jurisprudence is really what you talk about, the institution of the judiciary, an institution in which you have been absolutely central in, in building. And you talk about the history of that, the shift from the old apartheid judiciary to one that is particularly representative and, and diverse. And you get a sense of pride from you about that kind of shift, if you like. I know as a member of the Judicial Services Commission, you would have played an important role in, in doing that. You talk about building the constitutional court from scratch, and I know you weren't there for the very early years, but you do talk about the legitimacy of the court and its global rep reputation. And you very proudly talk about the fact that through all through thick and thin and through all the criticisms that the court deals with, its jurisprudence is a golden thread um, that goes through, that people do keep coming to that court to have their disputes resolved, to have their rights vindicated. So even as the political infighting amongst the ANC elite and other ruling elites begins to spill over in the court, that very important function stays very stable and, and firm. And again, I think your choice of what I call your judicial voice is very powerful. The way you describe the corruption is through the cases. And just that those sets of narratives around the cases, which I think you do in two or three parts of the book, where you just say there was this case, then there was that case, and there was the other case. It's a very, very powerful story about what happened and how the courts were drawn in by all kinds of parties. And in the end, how the courts were that thin, what could I call them a thin blue line, a thin green line in the case of the not very well liked robes of the constitutional <laughs> court. Um, very powerful story through um, the, the lens of, of, of the course of that. It's in that sheer volume and content and that simple description that we see how important the courts have been in upholding our democracy. And, and beyond that, of course, particularly compelling and interesting are your insider accounts of those battles. Um, of the way in which the executive really started criticizing the courts and if we're in a way in which you were front and center. You were very much at the center of this critique. It was, it was personal and political. It was an attack on Mosaneki and an attack on Mohuing and an attack on the institution. And I think that's what I like about the book particularly is the way in which the personal and the political intertwine throughout it. Um, and the way in which you acknowledge the difficulties in finding your voice. I mean, you use this wonderful phrase um, where you talk about, you, you agonize about the extent to which you should lift your judicial robes and bear your judicial soul, which I think is a, is a wonderful way of putting it to say, this was actually a part of a very, very difficult book to read because it was about me as much as it was about the country. There's an incredibly powerful section in the book where you talk about um when you learn that you are not going that you're no longer the heir apparent that you're not going to become chief justice and you talk about justice langer going to meet president zuma and you're in the office and he comes back late at night and you talk about the anguish and the tears of justice langer as he has to tell you that it's not going to be you and i feel in a way you're kind of you're talking about your own feelings through the feelings of a colleague. It's, it, it's a very beautiful um, description in, in, in the book. I, I, I really did like it as much as I think 
your, the way in which you then work with Chief Justice Mokhueng in building the institution into one that can withstand the endless attacks uh, that, that are coming on it is a way that really consolidates your political as well as your personal legacy on that court. And then, of course, that, that last chapter, that wonderful chapter on life, Essa Domeni, which I think for me is really a vindication of our constitution and the ability of constitutional rights to heal a wrong uh, and, and to say that this was wrong and I can say this was wrong and this is how your rights were violated and this is what I, I, I can particularly do about it. So in the end, I think this book is, is the most important insider account of the South African judiciary over the past 25 years that gives us as much I mean, I think that students are going to love it, lawyers are going to love it, I think literary scholars are going to love it as a kind of judicial memoir and what it means to have a judicial voice and what that allows and, 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 and what that disallows. But it also leaves things for us to ponder, rightly so, and work out. Sometimes you play your cards close to the, your chest, <laughs> sometimes you play open hand. And, and I suppose what I would want you to talk about just, just a little bit um, at, at the end is, is the book is full of ways in which our constitution has remained strong and has helped us build a, a constitutional democracy. You, you talk about people who disagree with that. And I would be interested in your reflection now, 25 years later, having written the book um, as to the, you know, we were so optimistic in the mid 1990s. We had so many ideas about the possibilities of the constitution. I think we probably thought we'd end up in a different place. But we, 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 we tried a different journey, and I think the Constitution proved to be as powerful as we thought it was going to be in a different way. And just to talk a little bit about the kind of potential and the limits of this idea of a constitutional project with the benefit of hindsight. It would be wonderful to hear those words later on. Thank you, Vizal. Can I, can I just quickly say thank you? You've, you've been incredibly kind. But more importantly, that you read all of the book. <laughs> it's always that uh, is some a pleasing feeling you get when you you meet somebody who has actually worked through your book, and uh, and I'm grateful for that. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Shamika, I'm going to hand over to you. Great. Thank you. Um, greetings, um, respects, and salutations. I think I'm going to jump right in. So as Kathy has mentioned, and as Justice Musaneke has reflected on, this book has incredible, incredible scope and breadth, traversed with the characteristic coherence, clarity, and elegance that we know of Justice Musaneke. As he had mentioned, it's written in a fashion that's strikingly accessible, and yet it's nonetheless poetic and inspires a close and attentive reading that Kathy has reflected on. It offers an embodied and reflexive account of the judicial system, its real consequences, and the gravity of the choice to pursue justice as a vocation, whether as a scholar, a practitioner, a judge, or simply as a human being. And I think that this humanizing quality is something especially refreshing and enthralling. Justice Musaneke describes the emporium of legal history and citation for future res researchers that the book provides. And indeed, it is a powerful contribution to the archives and the narratives of history. It invites readers, importantly, to not simply be passive consumers of knowledge as a commodity, but also to apply their minds to navigate the complexities of the realities that are intricate and therefore seldom black and white. Again, um, something that Kathy touched on. Um, it's with this in mind that I'll take the opportunity to reflect on three interrelated themes that I feel that the book evokes. These are epochy, reflexivity, and education, before ending with the privilege of a provocation or two. I refer to epochy here in the simplest sense of the suspension of judgment, that is, the ability to entertain and hold multiple potentially conflicting ideas and thoughts without prematurely passing judgment or arriving at an absolute conclusion. So Justice Musaneke provides, Musaneke provides a rich detail without imposing a version of events, narrative or take on history. 
but rather presents a candid advancement of a perspective and attendant facts that inform it, inviting engagement and critical reflection. A keynote example of this is, as Kathy also reflected on that much anticipated chapter entitled The Flope Matter, where Justice Mosineke takes a conceivably firm and unequivocal position while still relaying the narrative in such a way that it invites us as the reader to make up our own minds. Um, we may receive this, I submit, as a profound act of intellectual humility, especially given the intellectual giant from whom it emanates. Rather than condescending, Justice Mosineke invites us as readers to recognize and employ our own intellectual faculties. This leads me to the next theme being reflexivity. This reflexivity rejects the arrogance of the assumption of the possibility of an objective absolute in favor of intellectual rigor, resilience, and integrity that allows itself to be vulnerable and thereby demonstrates that vulnerability can be carried with dignity and elegance towards pursuing a humanity that elevates oneself and others. Examples of this in the book include um, expressing the feeling of being a legitimate intruder, entering the courtroom on the other side of a bench post-1994, as well as navigating what Justice Mosineke calls in my time syndrome that would be evoked by old era judges as commentary on the quality of the new. Again, as Kathy reflected on, grappling with these profound questions of what calls one to judicial office what it means to be a judge and the evocative and deeply trying question of whether he himself has been a good judge, all within a context, context not abstract and far removed, but true to an alive and ever moving society. In this way, Justice Mutaneke stays true to further reflections that he makes on the nature of respect. Kathy mentioned life is many and the notion of Boto or Ubuntu but also the description of respect as something to be earned rather than as something that is self-gifted. As such, he leaves us, and certainly myself, with this distinct sense that what we should be more concerned with is why we pursue our paths rather than the recognition that we hope that these paths will grant us. In Justice Musineke's words, I quote, we read too much into positions. We are too readily seduced by titles. We infer more power and influence and position readily affords one. There is also a form, I close quote, there is also a form of re reflexivity that is captured at several historical moments addressed in the book, where notwithstanding the excitement and the sense of profundity, the uh, optimism, as Kathy mentions as well, um, and the impact that the moments may have that are described, there is also the lingering sense that the significance of the moment would only be fully grasped years later. That the, the fact that this is shared, I submit, also conveys a, a continuance of that sense in the fact that this book and arguably this historical moment inspires similar sentiments. That such reflexivity allows us to strive to know, do, and be better as professionals but as people as well. And this brings me to the last theme that I hope to explore, and that's education. And the final, or rather in the chapter, final sitting, addressing his valedictory judgment on access to quality education, Justice Musineke refers to the idiom, tutu kileseri la sechava, education is the light of the nation. With the understanding of the importance of education in substance, and not simply as a formality. I invite us to consider for a moment Freire's contention that education either functions as an instrument to bring about conformity or freedom. Furthermore, that no pedagogy which is truly liberating can be distant from the oppressed by treating them as unfortunates and by presenting for their emulation models from among the oppressors. The oppressed must be their own example in their struggle for redemption. Taking this back into the corridors of the legal fraternity, in the book, Justice Musineke mentions the raging debate on the usefulness of the constitutional transition. Briefly traversing in the beginning of the book, some of the tensions that were 
evident in the political processes and compromises in the drafting of the interim and 1996 constitution. Later on, he writes, and I'll quote, murmurs were beginning to get louder that our transition to democracy had come to naught, that the resultant constitution and the meaning that the court had given to it were not fit for purpose, that the, that the farce about the rule of law was an excuse to entrench colonial power relations and historical privilege. The debate implied that the constitution was not sufficient, was not a sufficient condition for altering social power relations in society. It was indeed a valid debate to be had. I entered the debate with a good few papers. I close quote. In recognizing the importance of education and the call to be our own liberators, followed by the call to rise, the question lingers. How do we reckon with the fundamental economic, political, and historically contextual challenges that our country faces without resorting to orthodoxies, dogmas, or dismissals that while at times claiming to engage difficult arguments may tend to fall into the trap of coll collapsing and conflating disparate scholarship into a monolithic discourse of disloyalty or betrayal? In other words, is there an obligation upon all of us to avoid strawmanning inconvenient arguments, to resist dichotomous binaries that suggest that the truth is at one end of the spectrum of constitutional worship or rejection, or any such oversimplification that we might find ourselves confronted with. Furthermore, what does it mean to the young and aspiring lawyer to confront an embodied experience that is still not reflexive of the liberatory ideals so poetically encapsulated in the Constitution. In other words, and finally, by way of provocation, how do we keep that light of hope in our nation, in our scholars, in our students, in our legal practitioners alive, and ignite action that precipitates a better life for all, a life of dignity that all of us certainly deserve to rise to? I thank you. Thank you, Shomika. Justice Musaneki, I'm going to hand it over to you to just address some of the questions posed by Shomika and Kathy. <clears throat> well, well, thank you. I, um, I'm truly grateful uh, to both of you. And um, both have you've raised very fundamental questions that I am going to try and address briefly, but I do not propose to cover all of them. But the reason that you have um, formulated the inquiry and, and by and large uh, addressed most of the inquiries in a way uh, that you understand through the book and, in other, uh, and using other uh, academic and, and intellectual resources to be able to do that. Let, let me start off with a question around the constitution and that debate. Just the other day, I had another session with one of your colleagues, uh, Professor Tsepo Manjingozi, and Advocate Nugai Tobi SC. Uh, so it was good to have those young lions come at me and, 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 and raise charging all the time, almost like I'm one of those, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, who sold out in the sense that I was around. And, and I, I often make the point that there's often what in philosophy is called a category mistake, where people they collapse the high ideals of our revolution that you call uh, being formulated poetically, truly so, on the one end, and what we did and failed to do. And if you collapse and roll those up into a colonialist, uh, or apartheid trick not to transfer potential well-being to the people is to attribute to colonial masters and apartheid masters way more power than they actually would ever have over us. The better narrative is the one that Pas Langa, I did, and a few other people did. Kathy also wrote that on equality. Uh, Dennis Davis has done that also in other parts. 
is to identify the constitution as a social democratic instrument. In other words, its origin was always an encapsulation of the higher idea. But runs over 350 years. And if you see it as a, a narrow process of 1994, you miss the vital thing that we have been making these demands and points over time. Take the centrality of dignity. There's nothing Western about it. There's nothing, there's nothing colonial about it. Indigenous people have always, not only here, but around the world in Southeast Asia and other parts of the world, Latin America, have always understood the centrality of their dignity. And the notions of non-racialism flow from a complete acceptance of other people's humanity, their equal worth and humanity. So these calls are not new calls that we have learned from somewhere, that those that are indigenous, home-baked, I'm human because you are human. And the source and strength and quality of my humanity draws from your very humanity without which I would not be. So these are not foreign things that we have picked up from somewhere else. If in 1994 and onwards, we had worked the constitution and its high promises as hard as we should have, as I've said in other instances, this would have been a different neighborhood. This would have been a different neighborhood. And the squalor and the dirt and the pain and the poverty would have been of a different texture. I'm not suggesting that inequality would have evaporated. So the constitution, <clears throat> I think it's an error to trash it as meaningless. Just as it is an error to trash the transition in 1994 as meaningless. I think, and you find it through the book, you know, the court was an example, for instance, of shifting power from the old guard. I write that history to make that point. Toxic, toxic white male masculinity moved within the realm of peace and constitution and transition towards a more integrated space where judges are drawn from everywhere from the academy, from, from, from the tennis profession, advocates profession, and therefore you, you let it escape the elitist arrangements that were there during apartheid. And avoid replicating white <clears throat> male masculinity, which, which was always toxic and, and, and a core part of colonialism and apartheid. So we tried, and that's what I mean in the judiciary, and that's some of us were banging at it. It's transformative. Its purpose is to liberate people, to give them access, to make them better people. And it's rightly non-racial. It's rightly looking askance at those who exclude others for the sexual choices they make or orientation they have or the way they pray or the gender that they might be. So it was a big leap provided we, the liberators, and I mean all of us, I'm not, not some group in prison or in exile, all of us would continue to be our own liberators. So that is the point I was trying to make that the judiciary had a space and place there. Two, you're quite right, there's no absolutism. Both you and Kathy make the point and they cannot be. You see, you'll be surprised, the last, Significant judicial memo was written by Rose Innes at the turn of the what, 18, 18 something, 1888, 82. Go and look at it. Where, where somebody was trying to record extensively um, their judicial experience. Other colleagues have, I know colleague Cameron and colleague Sachs have written. Uh, somewhat in part their own lives and in part their judicial lives. So I never knew, as I say, what is in, what is out. Which jokes around the judges 
you know, coffee table are in and we jokes are out. And so I tentatively go out there and show you that we're human. But I was also very determined as I lift the judicial gown to say, we are just human. Our task to advance a just society, socially equitable society is just pretty much the same as executive. They have exactly the same role that, and obligations that we have, so the legislature. That's why I decry their failure, for instance, to hold the executive to account. And it was the courts that always had to do that. So to sum up, I think both of you have done incredible service to those who might listen and to myself as you pick up the theme so ably. Um, the last little point and um, that you go to Chamiga is, is, is all rise and tying it up with we being our own liberators. Indeed, they are connected. At, at a ordinary level, plain level is what we, when we are called to duty in courts, we say, all rise. So we start working. But that's probably the lightest of the meanings of the title. And hopefully the most potent is just reminding us of the high, 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 aspirations that we fought for for 350 years. And that whatever, was and all, the constitution could have been a plank and a platform for more revolution. And that if the people were to forget that they have an obligation to all to rise, it would be sad. Then we'll end up in a says pool of inequality, of lack of thoughtfulness, of lack of accountability, and the desire, your hope point, the desire to change our lot. And that is why in the, in the forward, in the prologue, I do hope that our people will never forget to rise and that all of us would rise, both socioeconomically, but also when we are unhappy, we'll remind each other that we we have the duty to safeguard our democratic gains. Thank I'm you. done, Prof Domingo. <laughs> I, 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 you know what, with these technical things, I'm looking where am I muted, am I not muted? But thank you for those words. Um, we do, I want to remind everyone that they can use the chat function to put in some questions. Um, Justice Masaneke, we do have some, so I'm going to read them out to you. Um, I have one here from- um, I've obviously. just opened my chat function too, so I, I can see them, but you, you, you go ahead. I will, I will read them. So these ones were sent to us because some people couldn't use the chat function because they were they they on the YouTube channel. So I'll do some of the ones that we have in the chat function and some that sent um, outside of the chat function. So we have one by Mamusi Motsepi who says, many admire you for the distinguished legal career and for your distinction as a judge. Many more revere you for your courage as a freedom fighter, which resulted in your incarceration at an age of 15 on Robben Island. Given this history, how do you feel about the virtual paralysis of your political alma mater, the Pan-African Congress of Azania? <laughs> Many within the PAC desire your return to the echelons of its leadership. Who do you return to lead the PAC to glory? That's the one. <laughs> Then we have another question from Utumaling Sedlochelo. And the first question is, is there a way to fast track the life isidemeni payments to the families after the ruling was made for them to be compensated? That's one question. What do you make of the incapacitated organs of the state that deal with law prosecution and enforcement? That is, it's impossible to prosecute high profile individuals and institutions due to the lack of human and financial resources. So I'll stop there. If you want me to repeat anything, you're most welcome to let me know. 
Well, well, let's let's start with my alma mater and the PAC. Um, I've I've made a choice quite, and I spent a lot of time in in my memoir to explain the first memoir whether I would play a political one in our country you can't play both. You have to make a choice, so you can play only one of the two. Um, and I made the choice that I was going to play a judicial role. And I want to suggest to you that it's a role and the book, if you read the book, as important as the political role. And maybe, maybe more important. Think about, I mean, the last 25 years without a court, somebody has to blow the whistle, not everybody has to play as part of the team. But the second point is, it always hurts when any historical formation suffers difficult blows. But let's remember, and I've said this quite often to young lions, to young members of the PAC, members of the ANC, members of Unity Movement, of Black Consciousness Movement, they often debate with me. You, you see, we should always draw a line between vessels and contents. It's important to draw a line between high ideals of a glorious struggle and the movements that might want to advance those high ideals. Sometimes they fail. I often give an example, particularly to young colleagues that I debate with. If you decide to take a trip to Mtata, and your vehicle gets a punch of four wheels somewhere on your way to Mtata. That does not alter the destination, a trip to Mtata. It may very well call for you replacing all four tires and taking steps to replace the tires. Then the vehicle is retooled and you might get to Mtata. If you can't replace the four wheels, you don't spend too much time bemoaning that. It may well be that you leave the vehicle there and start walking to Mtata so that you get to the destination. So let's not conflate and collapse vehicles, i.e. like movements and the high ideals. Um, there are many wonderful things that Pan-Africanism has offered to the intellectual lives of, of our country. Um, and those wonderful nuggets ought to be used in order to advance the interests of society. Um, but to confuse bells and whistles and t-shirts and rallies and slogans as the destination is to do a lot of harm to ourselves. And that's my answer to that. So I'm not gonna get back to, to, to that point. And, and I would hope that we actually understand when a vehicle is, is punctured on all wheels, you leave it there and, get, and try and get another vehicle or indeed try and retool it and, and, and get, it, get it proper. And that indeed is my alma mater, very proudly so, and you find it in the book and you find it in many where places where I acknowledge that. Life is a demand, I know that the province is working hard at that. I cannot change those circumstances. In fact, I've been having correspondence from the premier's office lately, telling me of some of the challenges they have and the many other new claimants who have come to the fore. The proper discussion should always be with the, with the province. And if your case falls within the parameters of my judgment or award, the courts will come to your assistance because then it will be a binding arbitration award. So you have a remedy. Uh, the last, the third question was about institutions. Yes. In the book, I invite, for instance, Minister Khadeve to say, tell us something about his watch, his period, and how some of the justice institutions met. Essentially, they are, you know, their demise and their worst time. You see, there should be a line between institutions for the people 
And the constitution tried to do that by creating institutions, some in chapter nine, others outside of chapter nine. The primary purpose is to live above the political echelon. Ruling elites falter around the world, but institutions ought to be there. That's why courts must remain effective, well-run, judges well-trained, doing their work effectively. And I write about how that happens in the book. That's part of the message I'm sending to all of us. We tool and keep the institutions, we train those who may person them in a way that occupy them, in a way that allows us to live above political contestation, which we know will be there. Look at Lebanon, look at Belarus, look at, name it, around the world. Look at Thailand, look at, you're going to find that contestation. So we must have an NDPP that is above all that rank up. We must have courts that live up to, take up the heat and be above that rancor. And we must have hopefully permanent secretaries or people like that who actually will be there when their political principles have been voted out or have run into some misdemeanor or something like that. Because all we want is home affairs to run. We don't care to who's, who the political head is. So, in that way, what I wish for my country, strong institutions, we don't have them now, but we're entitled to them and we should strive. And for where I come from the courts, I pray every day that they survive and be good and serve the role they served in the last 25 years. So yes, we need institutions. And I was talking at a funeral the other day and I was saying, Professor Domingo, young lawyers might rethink how they defend institutions. Pass, do articles, go to practice, make money. That's one route. And that's a route we had to take because apartheid never allowed us into any of the other institutions. It may be that young people must pass and go into the academy. They must pass and go into competition commission and tribunal. They must talk, you know, queue up and say to advocate Batoy, they want to be prosecutors. They with their bright brains would like to follow the trail of money. So, so we, we have to rethink what young activists who are trained in law can and should do now. It's very different. Not everybody should just be practicing law and marking big fees. It may be that. Most of us should go to the institutions and the you know, Human Rights Commission, what else, all of those could go and defend the entitlements of our people in those institutions. Uh, that, and that might be the new way to rise. The new way to go is to go and stop the bad people by getting into institutions and making them good. Thank you, Justice Masaneke. I, I think you speak to um, the legal fraternity, but law schools as well. What kind of graduates do we graduate, right? At, at, in years before, and you, you write this in your book, there was a particular way in which you taught law and the product and outcome of that was designed for a particular um, profession. And then we need to think broadly more now about the product that we, we produce. So I do have a question which follows up nicely with that. It's from Katlaro Mohosi who says, what message do you have for young attorneys and advocates joining the legal profession? And then the next question I have is, Justice Masaneke, what are your thoughts on the highly politicized appointment of the Chief Justice in the hands of the President? And do you think there's a need for a more competitive process? Thank you. So that's the one. And I'm, I'm, I'll take about another two more questions. 
Firstly, congratulations on writing this masterpiece. Unlike Kathy and Shamika, I've not yet read the book as I'm getting my copy only tomorrow. I would like to know what kept you going during the times when you were relentlessly attacked by those in power when you raised critical issues. How did you manage to keep strong even though your person was the most of the time slandered by politicians who felt that they were waging a personal, that you were waging a personal attack on them. Well, thank you, Prof. Domingo. Um, all important questions. My wife has just said to me, be short, you're talking too long. So I'm going to ask, um, you see those partners are there for, they often tell you, hey, you're talking too much now. Um, to the young attorney, um, Dumela, I, I would like to say to you, we have to find new ways. Look, let, let me start here. The profession, our country is going to become poorer. Our government would be, have less money than it used to have in the past. So there won't be too many lawyers will be briefed with big you know, briefs and lots of money paid to that. As it is, we're paying a lot of money to lawyers to unearth wrongdoing. Think about it, wasting a lot of money paying lawyers to find out what went wrong. Okay. So, and I think you're going to find that after COVID, the businesses and so on, there'll be less money available for, for lawyers to go out there and make tons of money. It's not going to happen anymore. It's going to change. So my suggestion and, and my, my view to young attorneys is that practice is the one end. But frankly, public institutions, another end. You know that currently the government outsources all its legal work. They have, they have lawyers inside, but they immediately are there only to channel work out to lawyers in private practice. Like builders inside, but you know, they find people to build homes, they find people, so they 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 outsource all the time or tender out the work all the time. I would pray and hope that would have, for instance, a state attorney, truly robust, truly capable of litigation. And many of you will find employment and get used to the idea of taking only a salary home and living within the parameters of those salaries. And forget the idea of going out there to practice and become uh, quite and yet those professionals live quite well. They live comfortably, as do professors, as do many other professionals. So we have to change our national psyche from big busting lawyers to people who actually are going to go out there and, for instance, enforce most of the law, regulatory framework in our country. You need lawyers who are going to have to do that. And that is my advice to most of you. Please come and strengthen the institutions. The second thing was, you see, when we wrote the constitution, we thought about how to appoint a chief justice and the deputy. After much debate, the compromise was that it would be a process in which all the judges, and I spent time in the book to talk about that, will be basically handpicked by the JSC and the president is obliged to appoint from a slate. So the president has no option but to appoint the people that the JNC would recommend. Save in the case of a chief justice, the deputy chief justice and the president of the Supreme Court of Appeals. And those roles were seen to be, to have a potentially political color to them. Those are the people who talk regularly to the executive, to heads of, of parliament and so on, and they'll play an administrative role and so on. And therefore it was seen that the, chief, that the president should have a hand in appointing, in picking the chief justice and the deputy chief justice. And in the book, I spent some time to explain that. The president has the right to pick the deputy chief justice, like President Becky picked me and picked Justice Langer and the president then presents those people to the JSC. And as you all have seen, the JSC have to 
advise the president on whether there have any objections to the person that she, he, president has fingered. If everybody says, okay, then you are appointed as chief justice or deputy. That is the structure of the constitution that you cannot change. What we should ask for is that it should not be unduly politicized. In other words, the chief, the, the president would apply her best endeavors to appoint the best competent person to do the job. And that is something, but the, the structure, the architecture of the constitution is that the president handpicks the chief justice, deputy chief justice and head of the, of the SCA. One day if you change that, maybe you might reduce that challenge. Uh, but if it is properly exercised, I think we should, we, should, we should do well. It's part of the checks and balances which the constitution was trying to achieve. That is not the judges themselves who would pick their own chief justice and so on. And, that, and for instance, the president can't pick anybody he, she likes to become a judge. Only the JSE can say she is fit and proper to be a judge. So there is a kind of balance that is there. So I've got much complaints about that. Um, um, I, I think it is, the lastly was that there were a lot of personal attacks on you and so on. Yeah, you know, it comes to the territory. I, th I think when I talk to younger listeners say in, when I go to speak at high schools and so on, I tell them about the referee. And there's one side, it's, Mamelodi Sundowns, which I support coming from Pretoria. Or one side is Blue Bulls, which again, I support because I come from Pretoria. Then on the other side, it might be the Lions from Joburg and Kaiser Chiefs. The referee in the middle is obliged to do the right thing, know the law firstly, applies the laws of the game and endure the distaste of people pillaring the referee. Sometimes they throw bottles into the, into the stadium and they swear at the referee when he calls for a penalty for the one side. So it's part of the job. I don't say it should be done, it should not be done actually. I think people should behave better, but only those who wield political power in society. I think when they criticize judges, they should do so fairly. And in relation to the actual reasoning and, and, and the outcomes that they reach and not have ad hominem or personal attacks. And we've seen them. And I tell you in the book, past Lange and I would not have been amused having spent all our lives in the liberation struggle. For anybody to suggest that we were less than worthy of being good patriots. Um, and on a lighter note, as you know, that Justice for Universities and said, well, if I miss, you know, if, if we have dollar accounts in some island, Cayman Island, can I just get the account number, please? Because I want to access the dollars. You, and showing out the nonsensical rubbish that people are spies sitting on the constitutional court. And if you have time to look at the book, you'll see I give you the report of the inspector general who says, oh, nonsense. Mr. Neke is the finest patriot that this country has produced. This in the face of some allegations by some members of the executive that we were spies. So yes, it is low, we shouldn't do that, but it's going to happen in every institution that stands its ground. I think Professor Dilima Tonsela too was said to be a spy and a few other judges and so on. But it comes to the territory and you, you, I think you've got to soak it up, you've got to take it out and do your work and, and ignore unfounded and unfortunate attacks. Thanks for that. Kathy Shamika, I'm going to ask you any follow-up questions, anything you've listened to Justice Musaneke, is there anything else that you'd like to ask or pose? I'm gonna bring- Well, I see Zach Yakub there, okay. Professor Zach Yakub online with a question. I hope he finds time to talk to me. I just say now on the chat, on the chat list. <laughs> but you go ahead with your work, please. Don't, don't worry about that. 
Ok. Sorry, I was on mute again. So just to say, oh, you're on mute again. <laughs> I see. Okay, congratulations and well done. That's what um, Justice uh, Zach Yakub is saying to you. Um, I see. Oh, okay. Zach, yes. Um, Shamika, Kathy, any um, follow-ups, Kathy? I'm going to hand over to you, and then uh, Shamika. I, I mean, I, I, I really want to agree. I, I, Justice Mosnicki and I sing from the same hymn sheet. When I always tell my students that if we want democratic politics and government to work, go and work in government. Um, it's the only way we'll get a functional government is if people with skills go and work in the institutions. Um, and it strikes me that that sort of individuals and institutions are inextricably linked. We have weak institutions if we have weak individuals staffing them and if we have weak leadership in, in, in the institutions. So I think that's fundamentally important. I, I do have a question, although it's not related to the book. Um, but Masaneki might be drawn, just, Justice Masaneki might be drawn to answer it. I've been quite interested in how the courts have been adjudicating the COVID-19 applications in terms of, uh, and of course, some of them are, are, are really ill-advised, I think, in terms of going to court on, on, on a range of things. But there's an, there's an interesting deference, I, I, I think, in, in this pandemic. Um, maybe correctly so, because we are in a pandemic and um, it's, it's, it's extraordinary circumstances. Um, but it's inter interesting to me that it, it is a moment where the courts do seem to have taken a step back. And, and I just wondered your, about your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think you guessed properly, Kathy, that you're not going to draw me out on that. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not going to get out. Part of being a judge is almost an obligation not to be unduly contrarian and unduly, um, unduly dispute-seeking and so on, but only in relation to your profession. There's some unstated code, and you mentioned it yourself. You don't want to be unduly controversial, particularly about the roles and functions, only because you're, you're no longer doing that. The general proposition must surely be judges must be available, the judicial system must be available, must be ever present. I talk a little about the, the urgent court. It's a great institution that we found at the court and we all kept it. You should be able, if somebody's trying to run off with your, your baby on an aeroplane and you've just fought and you have part partners or a couple, whatever, you should be able to rush to your court, get an interdict, stop him from here from getting onto an airplane, and the matter can be debated at a later time. So agency is a very vital part of justice. And, 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 and the law and judges should be available to intervene in urgent moments. And that's why courts are never shut down. And our constitution is very careful not to do that. So courts should be there available and ready to hear disputes even in difficult times. And you know some of the famous cases um, were written about measures during the war, if you remember, and the much often quoted passage from uh, Lord that Lord Dareham or somebody was talking about the law never goes to sleep, even in time of war, even it should not be because people still live and therefore there should be no overreaching and there should be no, so yes, all, that's all I can say. That's a broad principle. Fair enough. Courts Thank you. should stay awake all the time throughout I mean, the most difficult moments. Thanks, Shamika. Sure, thank you. I think just to 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 appreciate the contribution so far, but also to reflect briefly on um, the the interest from young scholars and practitioners um, in in understanding what your words of wisdom would be. To perhaps probe that a little bit further on the question of nurturing integrity as a virtue and a value. 
not as an ideal that you achieve once you've achieved an office or a post, but in terms of of a, a value that you inculcate in yourself and in your being and relation um, in your own mind to other people. Are there words to young scholars, practitioners, um, and I think to perhaps the nation as a whole that you would give um, in terms of an approach to integrity or approaching integrity and, and reflexivity? Yeah. You remember in the book, I, I do spend a bit of time and I do, I, do, I do refer to that and talk about that. You quoted a passage from the book where I talk about that. The, something has happened in our nation. Some call it careerism. Um, and notions of suffering, of sacrificing, notions of being selfless. I don't know, somehow something happened. And one of the things that's why I say that young people should do is basically to defer their top down, whatever they call it, cars for a while. You can't complain that institutions are untransformed when you don't have enough people of color who are prepared to become professors and to work at universities as, as, as you, most of you are doing. You can't say that there's low gender representation when you don't have women who really want to get into those positions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we, have to, we have to do a bit of a rethink. If you're all going to become a judge, there are a lot of senior counsel in our country. And many are listening. I see that many, many people actually, participants who are listening here. And I urge them to accept judicial appointments. Serious contestations are yet to come. In a society as unequal and as uneven as ours. And I, I urge them to think again, you know, about, and if you do that, you drop in your salary substantially. You're not going to starve, certainly not. You're still going to earn three, 400 times what probably a domestic worker ends. But many, the penny has not dropped and it must drop. We need to have more and more young people who would go to research. It's not going to pay you tons of money, but it's valuable in society to create true knowledge. We've got to think around food production, for instance. How do we get people to move in those directions? How do we get young people to go and prosecute? How do we get them to embrace the high values of our society, even outside the constitution? That's where we must all rise, is to really get in them to, we firefighting currently. We commissioning, we, we, we want the Auditor General, we want, currently we firefighting. But we need a higher vision of a developed society where there is place and role. I would hope after COVID, many young people will go and specialize in immunology, in bacteriology, in all of those things that make us understand the threats towards human health. And I hope the laboratories will be tooled up. More young people will go with the sciences and some with the engineering and build more houses and, and lay down more pipes for fresh water for poor people who need that. So there's an opportunity to re, re throw the Gucci away and, and rewire ourselves to reconstruct the way we should have in 1994 to go and build roads and build homes and build. Uh, and that's my, my true prayer. And that's what all rise is about. And using the institutions that the people have conceived. We need strong public protector office. We need, we need all of those things together. Strong treasury, strong SARS and all of that, strong universities. And young people are the ones who can make it possible. 
they must replace all of us who are, you know, in the sunset and, and go there and actually create them. And, and they would be best placed to refuse to execute unlawful orders. When they're given political orders which are unlawful, it'll be those young people who say, no, I don't understand my work to, to be so. And unless there's that flood of good young people in there, and a demand that post must be created, so we have more young people. How could we have few prosecutors in a country with so many LLB graduates? So, yes, that is the message I'd like to leave. People, it's your time, this is your moment, and your moment is to capture state institutions, to live in them and make them best assets of our people. Thank you, Justice Musneke. I just want to read uh, part of the rest of the comment of uh, Justice Yakub. He says, I think you would, we would agree that the judge's role in achieving democracy is limited. The people must do it. I then I'm going to have one more question before we Yakub, start. Of course you're right. <laughs> <laughs> people must do it and we must be the tools of the people as they do it. So Justice Mosineke, one more question, and this is going to be a bit of a controversial one we're going to end off with. It is from um, someone who's watching via YouTube, and it's from a Zakona who says, you have spoke about safeguarding the Constitution. I want to ask what your thoughts are on Chief Justice Moheng Moheng's shocking rape rulings, given the current climate of gender-based violence. <laughs> You're not going to get me say anything about that. You know that you can almost anticipate it, right? Um, I think I think we yes we it's well water under the bridge. We we need to um, Chief Justice Mukwege is doing his work, and he should. I know he will do it as well as you know he can. And and I know that I've lived close to him when the judiciary was attacked. And we, we sang the same song, we were on the same side. And all judges should continue to be on the same side. And that side, Justice Yaakub is the side of the people. Hence my mantra, it's not what the ruling elite want, it's what is good for the people. That's what got me into trouble, right? The straightforward little line, which is just such, and, and Justice Mokweng did very much pretty much that when we worked together. And together we fought off uh, attempts at intrusion into the judicial function. And, and I'm sure he'll continue to do that. And that is his role and calling that, that he must continue to do. Um, but we should not unduly pillory institutions like that. We should try and support them and, and, and so that they can do the valuable work at hand. Thanks, Justice Musaneke. I, I, there's many comments on this chat, thanking you for your book, um, thanking you for being the Deputy Chief Justice, thanking you for the message this evening. But I think you've summed it up by the titles of your book. It says, all rise and be your own liberator. So I think those are the challenges we as, I wanna say as, as, as a young head of school and a woman of color at Wits Law School, I will take that message, I will rise up and um, we will try and have graduates who are their own liberators because I think that is so important. I'm now going to hand over to our vice chancellor, Adam Habib for, to close the event in a few last words, thanks. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Um, it's really been a special conversation. It's been a really special conversation and it's been special in many ways, Dekhan. I mean, it's been special because you've been engaging uh, our legal academics, uh, our senior academic and emerging scholar and it's been a conversation about demystifying the courts. 
it's been a conversation about judges as fallible human beings, as somebody put it just now. It's been about how the courts are at the nexus of politics and law. It's been a story about how the courts have uh, made judicial judgments and the thinking behind those judicial judgments. It's been a story about why institutions are important and how you can only build institutions with excellence. And I, I, I think we must, we must underscore that because there's many of our public institutions that are on their knees because excellence wasn't a part of it. And so I think it's a special conversation in all of that ways that it's between you as a judicial leader and legal academics confronting those issues. So I think it's been very special in that sense. I think it's also been special because it's a story of the courts and the constitutional court in a particular moment in our history. In the first 25 years of our democracy, when we are establishing the legal foundations of a nation, when we are giving interpretation to the values of our constitution. Uh, and these values, it will be, these decisions will define a nation for decades, if not centuries. And it's been particularly special, and I wanna highlight this because Shamika touched on it, and I think you reflected on it in, in your answer. It's about seeing the constitution. Well, firstly, it's about trying to understand our national challenges and the answer to the legal challenges that flow out of our national challenges to see that not either in the rejection of the constitution or the worship of it, but rather than in the robust engagement of that constitution. In a lot of ways, I, you know, the constitution is really special because it continually redefines the nation. It allows for the nation to be continually redefined. It allows transformation to be continually defined. It allows, if you like, what, it, what is possible to be continuously defined. It's a living document. And in a sense, I think Shamika picks on that, that you don't do resolve our challenges by rejection or worship, but you do it as by robust engagement because it's a living document. So I think it's special in that sense because it defines our nation in ways that would be different if we were just having a conversation with the deputy chief justice in another era or in another epoch. It's also special from a personal sense Special because you were the chancellor of Wits University. You were a chancellor in a particular moment at Wits University. You were a chancellor, as you well know, who provided me with counsel in very, very difficult moments during my own tenure when we had those midnight conversations about how to proceed and how to approach the president and how to marshal political will from the state in very, very interesting ways. It's special because in a sense, and I don't know if you remember this, I am speaking at a judicial memoir of an individual who I met 30 years ago as a young, as a young activist, researcher and academic at the University of Durban Westville whom I invited because he was effectively the deputy president of the Pan-Africanist Congress. And mm -hmm. I invited him to come and speak to a university community. And today he speaks about young lions, but that firebrand was precisely the young lion in 1990 who matured in a sense to effectively that dignified deputy chief justice that wrote this judicial memo. And so it's been special in many ways. And I wanna end by 
by saying something to you, Dekhan. You know, I've often said that as Africans, we need to do our own research. We need to produce our own technologies and we need to tell our own stories as part of the corpus of human knowledge, not as separate from it, but as part of the corpus of human knowledge. And in a sense, what I want to say today is I want to thank you for telling that story. I want to tell you for telling it in an accessible way, because I think too many times we as academics don't write for the society, we write for each other. And we need to write for society far more often. And I want to end by effectively reading, I'm not even sure whether it's the epigraph or the dedication, whichever it is in the beginning, because I think you've referred to it as well. And it says this judicial memoir would not have been possible if I had not been privileged by my country to serve its people as a servant of the public. Perforce, I dedicate this memoir to all the people of our land and of Africa who deserve respect, freedom and social justice, absent which I pray they will know and will revolt so that they all arise. It seems to me those words, Dekhan, are words of a lawyer, of a judge, of as Kaiser Koza says in the chat box, a chief justice we never had, as, a, as the words of an activist, the words of a leader, and perhaps most importantly, the words of a human being who was committed to freedom. And I wanna thank you for being who you are and for telling your story, for you honor us all by doing that. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Vissal, we in your hands again. Okay, yes. So Vissal, thank you. Am, am I going to allow to, are you unmuted or are you still muted? No, I'm not muted. I'm going to allow you the last word. <laughs> Absolutely. The only last word I have is to say thank you. And thank you to, to Vitz, uh, uh, starting off with you, Adam Abib. Um, I won't go on, on much flourish. Yes, it was 12 years that I was chancellor and a lot of that was spent with you. Uh, and the, you know, the law faculty, thank you for hosting this both head of school and you, Kathy and Tamika, and I, I really would like to, to thank you for the effort you took. And the people in the background who did all the work, you know, there were a lot of people who were shuffling backwards and forwards. At least two of them did quite a, a tremendous job. I'd like, to, I'd like to be grateful for that. And the hope and the trust being, certainly not to sell more books, but certainly to have more people having access to the book. And that is why an effort has been made to, to have books donated to law schools in order that people must be able to, to catch up with those themes that are in there. So it must just my way of saying I'm most grateful and, um, and hope that it will indeed start a, a good discussion, particularly amongst the young about how we avoid um, how do we how do we depart from the difficult position that we find ourselves currently um, and I hope that's what the debate will be and 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 not 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 anything more than that uh, again thanks to Vitz and and I really appreciate it lastly all the many people I can see the participants Many, many, many people have come out there. I would like to thank you. It's a more an impersonal medium, this. Would have been in some venue at Verts and they would now be serving lovely snacks and wine, I've no doubt, Kathy, at the very minimum, that what a launch would have been, but here it is, thanks to Corona, but uh, thanks to all of you being out there and hanging out throughout this, this process. Much, much appreciated. 
I don't have to say thank you to Kabonina, who is here, who has been here, and who's been here the last 40 years plus, and uh, so has made most of all this possible, and much, much appreciated. Lots of love. Thank, thank you. Adam, do you want to say something? No, no, no. I just want to say it's been a delightful event. Thank you to everybody that's here. Thank you for all of the people who made this possible. Thank you to, uh, to you, Vissel, for for, for playing the role that you did. And Dekhan, I'm sure we will uh, still intersect in a face-to-face -face interaction at some point this year. Yes, I'll be in London soon when all this is done and then you have a chance to host, okay? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, guys. So, thank you and good night. Thank good you, night, man. everyone. Bye -bye. Travel safely. Thank you. Bye. Many thanks, Justice Musaneke. We are privileged and honored tonight. So thanks. Thanks, Vistal. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thanks for organizing it, Vistal. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Romika.